So start thinking about these problems so that on Tuesday uh, we go over them and uh, it doesn't look as easy as when you don't think about it and you just see me doing it, which is kind of misleading sometimes. Okay. So first problem in 2.2. So our first the problem is to show this uh, double implication. And uh, there is one which is trivial, but let's write it. Uh, if you have this, to prove this implication, uh, you just say that if AN converges, AN is bounded. And if AN is bounded, AN is bounded below. But there is not much here because you are not even using the fact that you have a monotone sequence. You are just using convergence implies bounded, which implies bounded below. None of these implications can be reversed. In general, they are not true. Now, the, the interesting uh, implication is the other way around. Uh, if it's bounded below and decreasing, then it converges. Okay? So you, you just imitate what we did for uh, increasing, and you call A, for instance, the set of uh, AN. And uh, remember, the, the strategy is to produce a number that will be a candidate to be a limit. Okay, that's, a, that's the main issue here. How do we find a number? How do we show uh, that there is a number that's a possible candidate to be a limit? And that's using the fundamental property of the rings. So uh, what we do is A different from empty because A1 belongs to A. And then we say that uh, uh, since AN is bounded below, by some k, then it means that an is bigger than k for all n. And then uh, it means also that so a is bounded below by k. Okay, so that's uh, just a writing uh, process where you, you call your set of A and A and you show that because A and it is bounded below, of course, that's equivalent to having the sequence bounded below. Okay, so now fundamental property of the reals. There is uh, A has uh, greatest lower bound that we are going to call L because that's going to be our limit actually. So um, now that we have L, we can show that AN converges to L. So we start by saying take pick epsilon is weakly positive. Then uh, if we add L plus epsilon, uh, 
is not a lower bound. Okay, or is the same thing? It's not a lower bound because L is supposed to be the greatest lower bound. You add anything to it, you are not a lower bound anymore. If it's not a lower bound, there exists an A in A such that A is less than L plus epsilon. But the A's that are in A are actually terms of the sequence. So I can put A N, and I use capital N because that's the usual capital N notation. You could call it J or P or whatever. That's not important, but just capital N because that's what we'll use. That's what we usually use. So uh, we get this. And now uh, we, we, we must use at some point that we have a decreasing sequence. Okay, and that, that's the point. So what we do is we say uh, if n is bigger than n, then a n is bigger than, no, it's the other way, is smaller than a n. Okay, that's the, the first time where I'm using my hypothesis. And therefore, we get that an is less than L plus epsilon because A capital N is less than L plus epsilon. And so an minus L is less than epsilon. But L is a lower bound of the sequence An. So An minus L must be positive or zero. So since L is a lower bound, of a n, l must be bigger than or equal to a n, uh, smaller than, lower bound, for o n. So what we have here is putting together the two inequalities is that the an minus l is a positive or zero number and is strictly less than epsilon for n larger than capital N. But if it's positive, it means that it's equal to its absolute value and we can replace this by this. And we are done. Okay, we have convergence. Questions? Five and four. Four first. Okay, so that's the one with 100 hypotheses. Um, okay, so we are told that AN is increasing, BN is decreasing, and AN is less than or equal to BN. is less than bn, an is increasing, bn is decreasing. And then we, we, we want to show that uh, an, well, we know so that um, uh, an minus bn goes to zero. However, already with this hypothesis, we can show that an is and bn are both convergent. How do we do that? Well, we don't do an epsilon proof here to show convergence because we, we have nothing to work with. We need to use a theorem. When we, when we see mountain sequences, we think about the main theorem, which is increasing and bounded above means convergent, and decreasing and bounded below means convergence. Okay, that's what we're going to use, no epsilon proof. 
So, uh, for an, for instance, uh, a common mistake is to say, well, an is less than vn, so it's bounded above. That's a mistake because this is not an allowed upper bound. This is something which is moving. This is a variable. This, it has an n. You don't want an upper bound that's moving along. That's not possible. That's not an upper bound. However, bn is a decreasing sequence. It means that I start at B1, then I drop to B2, to B3, and so on. So all my Bs are less than B1. I'm never going to be higher than B1. So what I can say is that since Bn is decreasing, Bn is less than B1. So An is less than B1 for On. And B1 is an allowed upper bound, because that's a fixed number. Okay, that's the first term of my sequence. Do you see that? So uh, we get that An is increasing and bounded above. This implies that An converges. Well, it converges to A to some a. We do the symmetric thing for the, the sequence Bn. This time we say since An is increasing, uh, no. Yeah, we say that An is increasing, then An is always bigger than A1 all the terms of my sequence for all n. All the terms of a sequence are bigger than a1. So uh, bn, which is bigger than an, which is bigger than a1, bn is bounded below. Plus increasing. Therefore, Bn converges to B. Okay? Now that we have that, we have that since An minus Bn converges to A minus B, that's operation on limits. And an minus bn converges to zero. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. But bn minus an uh, converges to the same thing as an minus bn because if, if something converges to zero, its opposite converges to zero as well. Okay? So it doesn't really matter. So you get that an minus bn converges to a minus b, and an minus bn converges to 0. So a minus b and 0 must be the same thing, which means that a must be b, and we're done. Yes? Yes, thank you. Other questions? Okay, number nine. So we have a limit in zero one. I'm in a hurry today. <laughs> okay, so number five, a n is less than b n. Okay.
uh, why, from where does this uh, number five question come? We, we know that uh, uh, the fourth property of operational limits says the following. If an is less than or equal to bn, then um, a is less than or equal to b, and, and a and a n converges to b to a, and b n converges to b. We have that. So that's that's what we proved. The question, the problem ask is whether by putting a strict inequality here, I get a strict inequality here. Okay, it makes sense to ask the question, but the answer is no. You don't in general. So. Uh, so the question is, does A n imply strictly less than B n imply A strictly less than B? So the answer is no. And uh, you can, so what counter example did you give? So A n is what? Negative 1 over n. And bn is 1 over n. Yeah. So we have strict inequality. Minus 1 over, a, minus one over n is always strictly less than 1 over n for all n. And this guy goes to 0, and this guy goes to 0. So in the limit, they are equal. They are not, the, the strict inequality does not uh, uh, persist. About this property, many times it's actually, the, the way this is used is with one of the sequences being a constant. Okay, like uh, later on in this homework, we need the following. So assume that you have a n converging to a. Assume that a n is bigger than one. then you are going to get A when you go to the limit. This strict inequality becomes a large inequality, and this goes to 1. And your end result is that A is now larger than or equal to 1. Okay? So just remember that when you pass to the limit, first thing, you need to have limits. And that's uh, many times an issue. But once you know you have limits, and that's the case here, because 1 converges to 1, and a n converges to a, then your, strict, your inequality becomes a large inequality, and you have a correct statement in the limit. Okay, So that's something we'll do over time. It's, uh, so the counter example is done. Now number 9. So we have that a n converges to a, and a belongs to 0. Fine. And uh, what we'd like is to show that a n is in this interval as well when our n is large enough. So the picture looks like this. Okay, what we know is that uh, a is somewhere but it's not touching either 0 or 1. And then uh, the idea is, well, because A is strictly between 0 and 1, I must be able to find an interval around A, and that will be my A minus epsilon, A plus epsilon, which is entirely in 0, 1. And for lowercase n bigger than capital N, we have A n in here and we'll be done. Okay, so that's uh, the plan. Uh, 
and uh, there are many choices for epsilon. They are going to depend on A in general. Okay, uh, there is no way around this. Uh, so one, one natural thing that we have been doing is say, well, A plus epsilon should be A plus 1 over 2, the midpoint. Okay, I, I want this point to be the midpoint of A and 1. Okay, that's one possibility. There are many others. So uh, that would give me an epsilon. If we do that, our epsilon becomes a plus 1, uh, so it's 1 minus a over 2, which is strictly positive. So it's an allowed epsilon. It's strictly positive because a is strictly less than 1. So, yep? That doesn't exclude a 0 necessarily if a is closer to 0 than 1. Exclude 0? You want the range around a defined by epsilon to exclude 0. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm taking care of this side, then I'll take care of this one. It's a, no, no, it's a, it's a good point. You, you, there is not really an argument that takes care of both sides at the same time. That's a problem. So uh, what we could do is say, well, let's take epsilon equal 1 minus a over 2. There exists an n1 so that if n is bigger than n1, then uh, a n minus a is less than epsilon. And a n is therefore squeezed between a plus epsilon and a minus epsilon. And in particular, uh, for n bigger than n1, in particular, uh, a n is less than a plus epsilon, which we took to be uh, a1 plus a over 2 for n larger than n1. OK? Now, we have the other side to take care of. And this time, we could, we could do, well, let's take epsilon equal to a over 2, which is the midpoint between, uh, I mean, what we want this time is take a minus epsilon, a minus epsilon to be a over 2, and therefore uh, epsilon would be a over 2. There exists an n2, so that if n is bigger than n2, uh, a n is between a minus epsilon and a plus epsilon. In this case, I'm interested in the lower bound, and I say then that a n is bigger than a minus epsilon, which is a over 2, for n bigger than n2. Now, if I want this to work, uh, I want both inequalities to hold at the same time. Okay, that's, uh, that's my objective here. Um, I can do the usual thing, which is let's take the maximum of the two ends. Okay, so define n to be the maximum of n1 and n2. And then uh, we must have that for n, n we have a n between a over 2 and 1 plus a over 2. This is strictly positive, and this is strictly less than 1. So we are done. And uh, I gave to some of you a different hint, which is also correct, uh, which is instead of taking the maximum of the ends, take the minimum of the epsilons. You can do that. That's fine. 
Okay? You take the, the smallest one of these two epsilons, you don't know what it is. It depends on the value of a, uh, how, how a relates to half. But that doesn't matter. You take epsilon equal to the minimum of the two numbers we came up with, and you say there is an n that works for this minimum. And then your conclusion is going to be the same. So both things are good. Now, B uh, is, uh, is there something particular about this uh, set 0, 1, where 1 is open? Or could we do things a little bit more general, like uh, uh, 1 closed? Or was it 0 closed? 0 closed. Can we do things with 0 closed? So let's state properly what, the, what we mean by that. So we mean that, is it the case that if uh, a n converges to a and a belongs to 0, 1, then there is n such that and then uh, a n belongs to zero one. D did you understand this as being the question, or did you have trouble with my uh, question? That was clear. Okay. So uh, the question, the problem is, if we draw a picture now. And the only difference with uh, the previous uh, thing is the addition of zero. So clearly, if uh, this is going to work, it must work for the endpoint. Uh, so assume you have your zero here. And assume your limit is actually zero. Then your interval around zero is going to be zero minus epsilon, zero plus epsilon. And that's not in your set. Okay, do you see where the trouble comes from? Because your limit can be a boundary point, when you put an interval at a boundary point, you must go out of your interval. And therefore, uh, the answer to this is going to be no. And one counter example, for instance, is a n equal minus 1 over n. This goes to 0. And 0 belongs to 0, 1. But a n is not in 0, 1. Never. So you cannot find a capital N so that after capital N, uh, your a n will be in 0, 1. That's the difference between a set that includes an endpoint or excludes it. It makes the property, a single point, makes the property of a set very different. Okay? So there is a, a whole area of uh, analysis that deals with these problems of being open or closed, and it's called topology. And you study, uh, usually in an abstract manner, what being open means. Okay? Because you can do this in any dimension, it doesn't need to be on the line. And in infinitely many dimensions, people get very excited. But uh, anyway, we won't, uh, we, we won't go there. Not today, at least. So, number 10. Okay.
So the first five turns, well, you are told that A1 is 2. So you get your A2 by plugging in 2 here. So that's 4 minus 1, 2, 3 half. Then A3 would be uh, 2 times 3 half. That's 3 minus 1, 4 over 3 half. So that's uh, 4 thirds. And so on. You just plug in your numbers successively and you get what you want. B show that for every n, if a n is strictly bigger than 1, then so is uh, a n plus 1. So let's assume that a n is strictly bigger than 1. We have a simple relation between the two. We can rewrite this as a minus 1 over n. And then uh, if a n is bigger than 1, then 1 over a n is smaller. And then with two positive numbers, the inverse function is decreasing. And so we get this. Now we can multiply by minus 1 this time. Yes. And we can add 2. And this is exactly a n plus 1. So I started with a n bigger than 1. I ended up with a n plus 1 bigger than 1. <coughs> C, uh, show that a n is well defined and bounded below. Well defined, what do I mean by that? Well, every time I compute something, I can plug it back here. The problem I have is that my expression is not a valid expression for all reals. I cannot divide by zero in particular. So well-defined means that I must make sure that my A99, for instance, is not zero. Because if it is, I cannot compute A100. And so I can't say that my sequence is well-defined. So that uh, I, I should be more precise in that question. but. Uh, when you have these expressions, you, the other way, the other thing which is uh, popular is to put square roots. Then you would make sure that your square root is always well defined, okay? that your expression doesn't get negative on you. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you need to use. But you, you need to, to do that. I mean, otherwise you don't know. So uh, C, you, would, you, you could do an induction proof. You don't have to. So what you could say is uh, a1 is 2, um, which is bigger than 1. And so um, if, if a n is bigger than 1, then a n plus 1 is bigger than 1. Uh, therefore, by the induction principle, a n is bigger than 1 for all n. Okay, that you. So that's one thing. And of course, uh, this also proves that 1 is a lower bound. of a sequence. Now that a n is decreasing, you may want to compute a n plus 1 minus a n and look at the sign of this thing. If you can show it's negative, it's decreasing. Negative for every n. So let's do the difference. We get 2an minus 1 over an. 
minus a n. This becomes 2 a n minus 1 minus a n squared over a n. And that becomes minus a n squared minus 2 a n my, uh, plus 1 over a n. So we end up with minus, this is a, a, a quadratic identity, so that's a n minus 1 squared over a n, and that's strictly negative. That's strictly negative for every n, why? Well, a n is number 1, it's always strictly bigger, so this is a positive number, but you have a minus in front of it. And the n is a strictly positive number, strictly bigger than 1. So this is always strictly positive, and you may conclude that your a n is therefore decreasing, strictly decreasing, actually. That it converges now is easy, because you know that a n is decreasing and bounded below. So a n converges to some L. Now, as I was telling you, because a n is known to be strictly bigger than 1, and a n converges to L, then you get this inequality. L must be larger than or equal to 1. OK, passage to the limit. Uh, f, 2an minus 1 over an converges to 2l minus 1 over l. That's operations on limits. That's all it is. Okay? What you are doing is just multiplication, subtraction, ratio of convergent sequences. So, I mean, you can, let's decompose it for this time. So what we have is that uh, well, we start with a n converging to l, then 2 a n must converge to 2 l. That's multiplication of two convergent sequences. Then 2 n minus 1 must converge to 2 l minus 1. That's addition of two convergent sequences. Then 2an minus 1 over a n must converge to 2l minus 1 over l. That's ratio of two convergent sequences. And we've, of course, the proviso that uh, your a n is not going to 0 and is not 0, which is the case here. So, we, so all that are just using the, four, the three operations on limits, right? This is multiplication. Uh, addition ratio. Find L, uh, find L. So uh, yeah, so we have that A N plus one. Is this. Now, a n plus 1 converges to L. Why is that? Yes, and we're just doing a shift. Okay, that was homework of last time. You do a shift of a finite quantity, left or right, you converge to the same thing. So no problem here. And here we, we just proved that this is 2L minus 1 over L. So these two limits must be the same. That gives you an equation in L. So you get L square equal to L minus 1, which is L square minus 2L plus 1 equals 0, which means that L minus 1 square is 0, which means that L is 1. 
So your lower bound is actually your limit. Your greatest lower bound is actually your limit. So that wasn't uh, very interesting, a little disappointing final. It would be nice to get something uh, uh, which is non-trivial when you compute these things. But um, I'll do better next time. So uh, the other thing that can happen in these problems is that you solve your equation and you find two limits. Then what do you do? I'm sorry? No, no, it does exist. I mean, the, the problem you have is that your algebraic expression gives you two possibilities. How do you exclude one of the possibilities? Yeah? If it's increasing or decreasing towards one of them. Yeah, you must place your limit. Like, you would find the typically L equals 0 or L equal 1. Well, it cannot be 0 because you know that L is bigger than 1, and 1 is a lower bound. So you get rid of uh, 0. OK? Questions? So let's uh, jump to chapter 5. And it's very much uh, the same ideas that you are going to use about limits, operations on limits, uh, epsilon proofs. So don't worry, you're not going to feel lost. So let's talk about continuity. And uh, uh, we're going uh, to have to deal with more complicated objects than uh, sequences, but similar objects, which are functions. So you, we have a, a function defined on some domain d included in R, and that goes to the reals. Okay, that's a typical situation. It's more complicated than sequences because uh, it's defined on a subset of reals, which potentially uh, is more complicated than the naturals. The thing with sequences is that you look only at n here, at the naturals. You go from the naturals to the reals. Here you are going from sets that can be nasty, but that won't be the case in this class. But uh, functions are, can be more complicated because of that. And uh, you need a little bit to, to think about what your D is. And uh, depending on what it is, you get different properties, which is not at all the case for sequences where you have a naturals and uh, that's it. Anyway, so that's uh, uh, the, the objects we'll be looking at. Uh, typical examples, uh, f of x equal 1 over x. Uh, d would then be minus infinity 0, 0 positive infinity. You, you want all reals except 0, so you're excluding 0. And continuity. Continuity is... Intuitively, a continuous function is a function that has no jumps. Okay? One intuitive way to talk about continuity is to say that you can graph the function without lifting the pencil from the paper. Okay? That's, if you have to lift it, then it's not a continuous function. So for instance, you could have something like this, where you, this jumps here, and you lose continuity. So you see I have my pencil here, and then there is no way to get here without lifting the pencil. So I go here, and I continue. 
So that's what we mean by continuous and non-continuous functions. Now we are going to use sequences to define this mathematic. And actually we have two definitions that will not look alike, will not look alike at all, but uh, they will have different uses at different times. So our main definition, the thing we'll be using is the following one. So assume that your function f is defined on d, which is included in r, which goes into r. Take a to be in d. Then f is said to be continuous at a if for every sequence a n in D such that a n converges to A, then f of a n converges to f of a. So we, we, we need to be a little careful in the sense that it doesn't make any sense to talk about f of a n if my a n is not in the right domain. That's why we need to say that. And then what we want is to say that if a n goes to a, then f of a n goes to f of a. Uh, why, how is this consistent with the picture we have here? So this is a function which is not continuous at A. It's not continuous at A. And let's say that the value at A is this thing here, f of A, is here. But then immediately to the right of A you jump here. So what you could do in a case like that is take a sequence a n which is a plus 1 over n because you, you want the trouble is from the right okay because when you get from the right you don't get where you should get which is f of a you get higher you get to this number here when you're approaching from the right so you take a sequence which approaches a from the right a plus 1 a n 1 over n goes to a and you see that f of a n, so I should give a new numbers here instead of this. Uh, so f of a could be 1, and uh, this could be 2, let's say. And what you see in the picture is that f of a n is approaching 2, which is not f of a. and therefore it's not a continuous function. Okay? I'm being a little quick here just to give you some intuition about this. Don't worry about, uh, we'll, we'll come back to it uh, with more time. Now, going back to this definition, you see that mostly it's going to be useful to show that something is not continuous. Because how are you going to check that for every possible sequence you have in D going to A, you have this holding? That's not uh, humanly possible. Okay? But on the other hand, you could show that there is a certain sequence, like we just did, for which this does not work. And then your function is not continuous. So it's mostly like that that you, we are going to use this uh, definition. And also, we'll, be, we'll know for some reason, from some other reason, that the function is continuous, and we'll use a property, which will turn out to be quite useful. Now, what does this say, really, uh, in terms? So, Let's look at again at this definition. We are saying that if a n converges to a, then f of a n converges to f of a. 
So what we are really saying here is that the limit of f of a n is f of the limit of a n. That's what we are saying because the limit of a n is a. And what we want is the limit of f of a n to be f of a. So the question we, uh, we have is whether we can interchange limit with f. And that's a very important question in analysis. I mean, most of analysis is concerned about interchanging things. And uh, these are not easy problems. And that's the first example. When we look at integrals, uh, we'll have the same question. And uh, uh, actually, there is the 20th century uh, analysis which is what should be called modern analysis, not this class. This is the 19th century uh, analysis. This should be the classical analysis. But the, the real modern analysis is really concerned with problems of this type. And the theory of integration that was built in the 20th century is quite different from the theory we are going to see. Because of this, it precisely uh, the, the problem of interchanging uh, integral and limit, function and limit. OK, so um, we can uh, prove a number of uh, things with what we know about limits. And that's, so maybe we're the f first property we should, well, OK, before saying that, let's uh, uh, define a few things. So assume that f and g are defined on D. And assume that A belongs to D. Then f plus g of A. So we are defining a new function f plus g. We know the function f, we know the function g. f plus g of A is going to be f of A plus g of A. OK, you have done this since uh, pre-calculus, at least. But what you should see is that the plus here is not the same as the plus here. Because here, I'm adding two functions. Here, I'm adding two reals. We use the same sign, because it would be a nightmare to do otherwise. But uh, uh, it's still not the same thing. And of course, you define everything else like this. f times g is f of a times g of a. And f over g is f of a over g of a. Of course, g of a needs to be different from 0. Otherwise, this is not well defined. Okay, so we, we define new functions like that. And uh, the natural question to get more continuous functions is to say, well, if I know that f and g are continuous, are these different things continuous as well? And the answer, of course, is yes. So assume that f and g are continuous defined on the same d. continuous at A belonging to D. Then F plus G is continuous at A. f times g is continuous at a. f over g is continuous at a, provided uh, g of a is different from a. OK, 
okay, a little bit of uh, how, how would we prove that. Assume that AN converges to A. Then f of a n converges to f of a. That's because, because what? what? What am I using when I'm saying that f of a n converges to f of a? That f is continuous at a. That's what the hypothesis I'm using. f is continuous at a. Then g of a n converges to g of a, continuity of g. Then f of a n plus g of a n converges to f of a plus g of a. What am I using here when I'm saying that f of a n plus g of a n converges to f of a plus g of a? Yes, I'm adding two convergent sequences. F of a n is a convergent sequence. G of a n is a convergent sequence. The sum is convergent. Okay, that's all I'm using here. This is operation on limits. And here is where my definition of f plus g comes handy because this is actually f plus g of a n. And this is f plus g of a. So that proves that f plus g is continuous at a. And the other proofs are very much the same. Okay, you can have a look at them. It's very much operations on limits. You you do uh, a product of of uh, sequences here. Here you do a ratio of sequences. Here is a difficulty. It depends what type of hypothesis you put. Okay, I, uh, uh, the hypothesis I put in the notes are a little restrictive, so you have to work harder uh, to to get it. But uh, we'll uh, we'll. We'll come back to the type of uh, thing that that's done. So that's a little uh, more difficult, but not much. Okay. Once you do this, it creates a lot of possibilities for your continuous functions because you you are going to start with uh, f of x equal x is continuous, and that's so. Maybe we should have say that. simply you say, well, a n goes to take the sequence a n going to a, but this is f of a n, we are talking about the identity, and this is f of a. Therefore, f of a n goes to f of a. There is nothing to do. Okay. So, f is continuous at a. Now, if you know that the function f of x equal x is continuous, you can show that x square is continuous, f of x equal x square. How would you do that? How would you show? Yes. Yes, it's a product of two continuous functions. Therefore, it's continuous. So x to the n, any power of x is continuous. And then you can have any polynomial. 
because polynomials are just terms uh, like 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus x minus 1. And all these are continuous terms. You add, subtract them, you still get something continuous. So you get lots of new functions being continuous uh, thanks to this uh, result. Okay, so uh, that's how we would define continuity and how we would show that uh, many objects are continuous. Okay, so maybe we should stop here.